Today we're going to talk about um, leveraging Azure Functions and kind of more generally Azure App Service for integration. Um, so to kind of before I kind of jump into what those topics are, I don't think really any of you know who I am. I'm kind of getting to know more of you guys as I spend more time here at the conference. Um, I'm Christopher Anderson. I'm a program manager on the Azure App Service team. I've you know worked um, bef I've, before working on the App Service team. I worked on SQL Server and Azure SQL DB, mostly in the security and compliance space. From there, I decided to do a pretty drastic change over to kind of more the application development space, focusing on kind of mobile and then transitioning over to the WebJobs SDK, which ended up being really, really fun. Um, and that project then kind of turned into the Azure Functions product, which I'll kind of talk to later today. So it's a bit about me. Um, I'll have my email and my Twitter again at the end because we're really about kind of reaching out and contacting us, but there's a reason I put that there. If you guys have questions as you run into things, um, you know, please send us emails. Um, you can also DM me on Twitter. I'm actually, I'll respond to tw tweets pretty much all day long, but my email I try to <laughs> regiment throughout the day, so just a handy tip for me. Um, as far as what we're gonna talk about today, um, we're gonna go ahead and introduce kind of app service in general. Um, so just so I know at the pace I should go through my app service content. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit standard content, just kind of educational stuff. How many people in here know what app service is? Good chunk. Okay, how many of you have ever deployed a web app onto Azure App Service? Also good chunk, okay. Um, so, and then what about, I, we asked this question yesterday, but just so I can kind of reinforce it, how many of you have heard of Azure Functions? You've all heard a lot more of it after yesterday. How many of you, have you, how many of you went out and tried Azure Functions? <laughs> Smaller number of people, that's what I expected. Okay, so I'm, I am going to spend a bit more time on the function stuff just to help you know, educate everyone here. It's a really cool thing that we think is really useful, especially for the integration scenarios. It's very lightweight, it's very composable with a lot of the different solutions we have. And so since it's so new, I'm gonna spend you know, a bit more time on that than the rest of the app service things. And I'm not gonna focus too much on kind of re-explaining logic apps, which we've already pretty well explained, and uh, API management, which we've also spent a lot of time explaining. Um, but I am gonna touch on those pieces as well. And then that's kind of what gets into the last section there, is then the actual integration patterns. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of take three you know, general integration patterns, talk through some of the problems that you might face, and how you can solve those patterns with app service. There's lots of different ways of doing it. I'm gonna kind of show just you know, bare bones, this is one of the ways of doing this with app service. So what is App Service? Um, you know, a good chunk of you guys actually know what this is, but it's essentially Azure's you know PaaS uh, PaaS service for hosting you know web API mobile applications. It's designed so that you can take just your web API, your your MVC, your Node Express site, what have you, and just host up there in the cloud. Not worry about OS patching. Not worry about the security issues that come with hosting applications in the cloud. You still have to manage your application security model, but as far as the actual infrastructure security model, that's all taken care of for you. Um, and a lot of features just come out of the box. You know, in order for us to do enterprise application development, we need to have a certain baseline of features, like continuous integration. We want to be able to do, you know, deployment slots and things like that, so we can have our dev test state uh, production environments. And there's a whole list of features there. I'm not going to go with them one by one. But it, it's really meant to be this kind of all-in-one toolbox for hosting these applications, really oriented towards enterprise, but really accessible by anyone. It's, it doesn't require being you know, certified in some you know, enterprise certification to start using it. We've designed it to be accessible for all organizations to come up to. So with that, <laughs> I just said accessible, but I don't think anyone, maybe definitely in the back, but maybe up, even up front, can any of you even read all the little text on the screen? I think this is something that uh, you know, we like to offer a solution for everyone, but that often means that we have a ton of solutions. So if, if that uh, screen intimidates you at all, uh, it does me as well. Every time I see it, I have to kind of, like, is there anything in here that I don't know? Like, I work on Azure. Is there anything here that I'm still missing? Um, but the real important stuff here generally falls within that green space for app service, but you also notice that we have this integration box here, which is gonna be a lot of the services that you can hear us Microsoft folks talking about. Um, you know, next one coming up here is going to be Service Bus, Dan over there. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot of other cool things you know, kind of in here for doing analytics, which is another kind of 
uh, component, which kind of sits next to the integration scenario where you need to start analyzing the data that's coming through your system. We have solutions for all these things, but you kind of have to go and educate yourself on the individual products, so. About app service, just to kind of talk to the pedigree of the service itself, we've got, you know, over 300,000 active customers. That's not just customers who've signed up, it's active customers using it, you know, daily, weekly basis. Um, of that, we've got 900,000 apps hosted, and we're getting, you know, over 6 billion requests per day, sometimes much more than that, but on average there. And, you know, really just kind of speaking to the growth, we're, we're a growing platform, we're a, quite a large team, um, and things are really looking well, so we're really f finding that kind of actually owning up to that, being able to host enterprise applications and having people trust that we really are enterprise grade there. The way that we think about app service, though, isn't just app service platform. What we generally think about app service with is actually the kind of apps, the scenarios that our customers deploy on to app service. This kind of segmentation makes it very nice for us to then kind of target these different customer segments and make sure that you know, we're actually addressing the needs in that space. You know, this kind of focus on the very specific scenarios allows us to go and find new features that we might not have otherwise done if we were more generalist. So for instance, our mobile apps uh, feature actually has offline sync. You wouldn't have actually thought about doing offline sync necessarily unless we had spent a lot of time thinking about doing line of business applications, which is where we see the majority of people using offline sync is them building mobile applications where they have folks in the field who don't have internet access very often. And we have a sample of that, and I'll talk to you in just a second. So just to quickly kind of walk through what we mean here, we've got a lot of different examples of how this, you know, how these things have been done on app service before. We've got this site, customers.microsoft.com, that you can go and see all these different white papers and use cases for. But in the e-commerce space, we've got Iberia, we've got jet.com. In the uh, digital global presence, there's NASCAR, which most people here probably don't watch too much of, but we've got Absolute Vodka, which I'm sure everyone likes to drink, and a little bit may maybe more relevant is uh, Real Madrid. So, As far as um, custom apps go, the Canadian election actually had their uh, kind of voting um, results displayed via you know, app service. That was a high number of traffic, and the great thing there was they were able to kind of develop and only be very, very small footprint. And then when the election happened in, in Canada, the election was a very short footprint, which I wish we had in America because I'm getting tired of it right now. Um, but in, you know, in Canada, they have a very short footprint when it all happens. And so they have a lot of traffic that hits them over just like you know, a few week period. And having to actually provision all the infrastructure, even having to provision VMs in the cloud, that'd be arduous for doing something which is you know, such a short time period. It's really great that they could deploy just a single instance of their application and then horizontally scale out when they needed to and then quickly scale back down after the, uh, the coverage had you know, waned after the election had finished. And then there's other examples here. We've got um, you know, Die Game, which does a whole lot of things. I think Eurovision is a song contest thing. I haven't actually seen that over here yet. I've been kind of looking through the channels for it. Um, and then line of business applications. So Alaska Airlines is a very popular airline with us. They actually, you know, they, you can fly standby in Alaska and they have an app for actually managing and helping you get onto the right planes when you fly standby for their employees, which is really nice, because I used to do that for United, and it was like, you go into the airport and you sleep in the airport hoping that you actually make the, night, night, the next uh, plane, and so this is, this is really good. I wish I had this when I was doing the United stuff. And then Transport for London actually hosts um, their line of business app on us, and really the important thing for them was actually the um, offline sync nature of the mobile solution that we offer. That being the case, I've been riding the tube around all week long now, and there's absolutely no connection <laughs> to internet or anything like that once you're actually traveling around down there. And so it's very critical for their engineers that are working on the rails that they can actually still continue to use the application, still work, and have kind of full fidelity until they actually have a chance to sync that data back when they have service again. And then, of course, we have you know, API services and ISVs. So these are all people who are using like API management and API apps to a large extreme. So you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is a very popular um, health insurance provider in America. Um, you know, various marketing agencies, we've got a lot of different things going on there, Q Branch and Morocco. So, didn't want to spend too much time kind of in here, but kind of going through the scenarios of what we generally hit, what we're thinking about as we're kind of thinking through our features, is we always kind of break it down through this segment first, and then we kind of break it down to the next segment, which I'll go into. 
So the next one that we think of is then we get to the services, right? We don't really want to design services without these scenarios in mind, which is the reason to kind of think through the apps first. But then we have to get to, okay, well, what are the services? What are the app types that customers are then going to use to implement these scenarios? So the first one that you guys already kind of saw a great presentation by Vlad on is API management and API apps. Um, you know, it allows you to quickly build APIs in the cloud. Um, API management makes it very easy to have a, you know, a large swath of API apps almost acting in a microservice pattern and then combine those into an actual cohesive API so you're not having to worry about all this various disparate pieces. It also makes it very easy to, if you have an on-prem API, connect via VPN back to your on-prem data set. Um, but then also extend that with you know, APIs that are based in the cloud so I can have this on-prem system that I never want to touch again. I don't want to have to worry about moving it you know, to the cloud, but I can then keep on developing for the cloud and no one's the wiser. I have a, I have a single consistent API for that. You know, and the way that, you know, these are just kind of development patterns, so these are how we think through customers actually using the service then. So it's, you notice here that the first step was we, we like to kind of push this idea of API first development. If you do have a complex API that you're thinking about doing, do that first before you start laying down any of the groundwork on the code that you'll be writing. If you have existing APIs, wrangle those into what your patterns you want to use. Any new APIs you want to write, make sure that you have the swagger set for those. Mock that up. Your client developers can then use that mocked up data with inside of API management to make sure that they're not blocked by any of the back uh, end developers actually completing their work. And then the back end developers also aren't having to react to any you know, crazy changes. You have a contract there via that API design that you agreed on initially. And then it's kind of the traditional flow for them, more or less. You just, you can use Visual Studio to do your API design. You can go ahead and implement your logic in any other language too as well. We have Java support, PHP, Node. And then you publish that, and when you publish that, you actually can publish that out to an API app and then use your API management to then react to that, react to versioning that you end up doing, and then use API management to actually control and measure and monitor those APIs as they're being used. You can track when your old versions of your APIs are gone away and you can deprecate that old API. Um, and then there's Logic Apps. So once again, we did a lot of things with Logic Apps, so I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but it's really about kind of um, empowering the integration scenarios in the cloud, really making it very easy to connect various things together and manage those workflows. And you saw the great UI designer that they have there, and it's very focused around this kind of you know, workflow based off of events and HTTP triggers that they have. So this is kind of getting into the fresh content, though it seems like a lot of you have actually used web application, or web apps. Web apps are kind of the um, baseline service. The interesting thing about app service is, um, with the exception of logic apps, everything on app service is basically just a web app with extra flavors added to it by default. So if you actually deploy a mobile app, it's a web app with push notifications and users just kind of turned on. You can turn those on on a regular web application. You can turn those off on a mobile app and just deploy a regular web app to it. So I'm sure that's confusing to you, but we're generally just trying to help customers you know, make logical sense of what their apps are trying to do. So if I have a mobile application, you can call it a mobile app inside the portal, but you can also just use a web app for that. Web apps just host your code. Um, I'll show a demo here in just a little bit where it's just really, really easy to take a site, you know, a little bit of code that I can run locally as a site and push it out and have it run by IIS for me and scaling's done for me and all those great things. And once again, you have a professional development flow that comes along with this that works just out of the box. I can develop with the tools that I feel comfortable using, whether it's Visual Studio, VS Code, or you know, what have you. Um, you can then push it out to a code repository or push directly to the web app itself if you feel dangerous. Um, you, know, make, you can use VSTS to then manage and automate your build system, your release system. You saw some of that yesterday with the Logic Apps demo where they showed doing their release management process inside of VSTS. The same thing works for web, for web applications. Um, deploy at stage, validate, publish, all that stuff. Mobile applications is just, once again, a specialization of that. So we found that mobile customers needed certain scenarios kind of solved for them out of the box. You don't want to have to go and implement your own push notification server to go and manage talking to the various um, different endpoints for sending push notifications. So we help abstract away the various iPhone versus Android versus Windows phone versus Amazon has their own push notification system. And then once you start moving internationally to like you know, Baidu and China where they have their own push notification system as well, that's helped be abstracted for you by Notifications Hub. 
And then beyond that, you also have um, the mobile apps SDK, which is something that I had worked on before, the functions, which helps you deal with offline sync. It allows you to really, as a mobile developer, actually just ignore the back end. You only have to write as much back end code as you need to make your front end work. And otherwise, it's kind of managed for you in, in, in those pieces. And then, of course, it also has like authentication that just works out of the box with an SDK. So you can turn on Twitter, Facebook, or probably more importantly for this crowd, AED authentication. So that way, my enterprise users can go ahead and log in with their Active Directory accounts. And that's all managed and just syncs across the various applications. And then the great thing here is that with Xamarin now moving underneath um, you know, Microsoft, you now have the ability to kind of do .NET end-to-end -end if you want to, which is very useful for a lot of uh, Microsoft enterprise developers. And we have a full end-to-end -end suite there, right? So you can use Xamarin Test Cloud to then test against the various different device types. Um, so I don't need to actually have my own device farm. I don't need to have tons of iPhones and tons of Android phones of every flavor. I can actually just go and send those up to Xamarin, and Xamarin will actually run those tests for me. And they have a test recorder. If you haven't watched the Xamarin like, uh, talk keynote from Build, you should really go and do yourself a favor if you do any mobile development in-house. It's, uh, it's really amazing stuff. And of course, the back end can also be deployed along with that. Cool. Um, so here I'm going to go ahead and just show a quick demo of how easy it is to actually deploy out an app-to-app -app service. I'm trying to go quickly here because this isn't really the meat of what I want to show. I want to spend more time on the integrate subjects. But in this case, I have just an, an ASP.NET MVC you know, 462 site. Um, I can go ahead and choose a published target. In this case, I already have a web app provisioned, but it takes about 30 seconds to provision one. It's just 30 seconds in a demo is like the longest 30 seconds you'll ever have. Um, in this case, and of course, I need to uh, re-enter my credentials in. So what this will do is this is now going to go and enumerate all of my resource groups that I have. And I need to go and actually select the right subscription. This is going to enumerate the resource groups that I have. In this case, I've chosen Sharande Test. And this is the one that I um, created for today. And you can see here that I can either deploy to my production slot or if I have deployment slots, which is what you should be using if you're actually doing real de uh, deployments, you can deploy out to like a staging slot or a dev slot that you have there. So I'm going to hit OK. It'll automatically go ahead and grab my um, published credentials and all that kind of stuff for me. And so if I want to, I can just hit publish and ignore the rest of the test steps that happen there. And then in short order, this is going to go ahead and run a build that I already, I already ran a build, so it should be nice and quick. And then it's going to go ahead and just do a web deploy out to that site for me. So in terms of actually hosting just a simple site, it makes it very easy. If I want to, I can slap AED in front of there via the same authentication feature that we use for mobile. Um, so we can go ahead and wrap the site without having to actually figure out how to do authentication within our MVC site if we want to. Um, and, and lots of just kind of simple features that kind of work out of the box that way. So this should go ahead and it's going to take, you know, longer than I would, <laughs> it's a short amount of time in an actual development flow, but once like I said, for a demo, 30 seconds is the, <laughs> the longest 30 seconds that you have. So eventually this should go ahead and kind of finish deploying. Um, but, you know, really the utility that you get out of here is just you have increased speed you know, this is just a web application, and I'm, I'm showing this one, but for API apps, the same feature is available. So as you are trying to take existing APIs and existing things that, you know, you might have some stuff on-prem, you might need to be writing new things, and you want to start moving to the cloud, kind of doing the hybrid cloud strategy, it's the same kind of deployment process for deploying that, um, you know, app. So now you have a much more kind of modern deployment uh, patterns available for you as you're doing these things. You don't need to kind of go and build your own deployment uh, cycles like you might have to do on-prem. You can actually just use a whole bunch of things that come out of the box when you're using, you know, Microsoft Azure, App Service, and DSTS. So, it's probably gonna take a little bit for this to uh, finish uploading this DLL, I think. I am on kind of strange internet. Of course, as I say that, it starts to try to move again. Um, but eventually this will go ahead and finish and it'll probably interrupt me. Yeah, here we go. And it actually will launch my web page for me and it's gonna go ahead and try to call out to my site. And this should finish loading. But there we go. Then I have my actual ASP to site, yeah. So thanks for the gentle clap there. I appreciate it. <laughs> so yeah, I debated whether to act, act not actually to kind of do that demo because it looked like a lot of you had done that, but it's relatively quick. That only ate like two minutes of my time there. So for anyone who hadn't seen that, you know, make sure that you actually check out um, the actual 
app service app experience for your, if you're trying to think about how to do your next business application. It really is the simplest way of hosting an application in the cloud. So as your businesses are trying to move more and more of their infrastructure and their sites to the cloud, it's a great opportunity. It does lift and shift quite well as well. So you don't even need to necessarily do bespoke things on there. You can actually move most ASP you know, sites pretty, pretty quick. Um, so now to kind of what I'm all about, which is Azure Functions. Um, I'm not sure, another question I forgot to ask, how many of you have used the Azure Web Jobs SDK? Much shorter amount of people. Azure Web Jobs SDK was, you know, is still, um, is, is still really good. The, the Azure Function stuff is actually kind of built as a shell around the uh, Web Jobs SDK, which means we're still investing in the Web Jobs SDK as we improve the Azure Functions runtime. Um, but it's a, it was a really, really great way of like listening on a service bus queue or a topic, being able to process those things, um, and kind of doing that with kind of this code-centric way of thinking about things. I didn't need to spin up a cloud service or a VM and write my own kind of polling um, application in order to do that. I could instead just via attributes say I want to listen on this service bus, and I want to the service bus queue or topic, and I run I want to run this bit of C sharp code in order to process that. And it had also, beyond just being able to trigger, it also had input and output bindings. So when I got that queue, I could go look up a record in a table, and then I could then store out those records to a blob. So it was helping to abstract those pieces. Functions, we took it a step further, and we started moving a lot of the stuff that you had to write a lot of code for and deploy a whole console app to do into more config-based things. So now we have config mixed with code to make it a lighter experience. And so that's the reason that you kind of see this, this cool thing here. And then this animation I'm very proud of, if it works. There we go. The way that we got our logo was combine those two things together. Thank you, thank you. Um, I actually was the one who designed that logo, so it makes me feel very proud. <laughs> I just sketched it on a whiteboard for our design folks, and that's what they decided to go with. So, um, and then, so I'm going to go ahead and show a demo of this here t uh, today, but I'm, so I'm not going to spend too much time in slides because I'm sure you guys all love having slides thrown down your your throat all day long. But you know, the general notion there is that I go ahead and I have a trigger that can react on a variety of data, very similar to how logic apps can react to a variety of data. I can have input bindings, so I can go ahead and fetch additional information in there. And then I've got my user code. And that code that I write there can be C Sharp, um, Node, we have PowerShell batch support, PHP, Python. We have a lot of different things. The one thing that's not quite super simple right now is Java, but it's something that we're working on to make much simpler. You can currently do Java by uploading a jar file and calling it with a batch. So that's not super slick, so we're working on that. Um, and the, the nice thing about that is then afterwards, I've got then got this notion of being able to output things. So once I've gone ahead and run that code, I can then have that code then trigger another event. I can go and have that code send some data out to blob storage or Dropbox or what have you. And so you can really kind of think of it as kind of being the, the partner to Logic Apps there, where Logic Apps is kind of doing that workflow based off of events and function cell being about doing code based of events, and the two compose very nicely together, as you'll see in the future demo that I have. Um, so with that said, this should be a much more fun demo since most of you haven't seen functions. <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen an application deploy before. So um, let's go ahead and jump out to my site. So I've gone ahead and set up my dashboard here, and I've got this function app. And I've got a couple of different functions in here and demos prepared. I'm going to go ahead and show just kind of doing simple hello world, a webhook, timer, queue, and then also showing a more rich uh, scenario, I'd say, in relation to logic apps combining with cognitive services, combining with functions, and how easily those things compose together. So inside of here, the thing that you'll notice is that we've got a great way of being able to go ahead and just get started quickly without having to dive too far into our UI. So when you actually create a function app, which you can all do right now if you're on your uh, computers by going to functions.azure.com, and we have a great kind of intro getting started experience there. Once you've created your function app via that experience, you can go ahead and just choose one of these simple scenarios. These are kind of the most common scenarios we see customers doing, and so that's the reason they're just up here in front. So let's say I want to create a webhook or an API endpoint via a function, and I'm going to use C Sharp for this. I go ahead and create the function. And in short order, we have a little tour here that I'm going to skip. You can all go and watch that for yourselves. Um, in short order, I have a little bit of C Sharp code here inside the portal that I can then edit. So as I go ahead and let's say that I, I want to go ahead and I want to um, see in my logs this bit of data here that I pulled in. Actually, let's just do name. 
All right, so I want to log that name out as it comes in. I can go ahead and hit save, and we actually have the environment set up to actually go ahead and compile that C sharp without you having to deal with Visual Studio Project or anything like that. In another demo, if you guys want to dive into that and I have time, we can actually go ahead and include a project.json with NuGet references. And as I modify that project.json, we automatically go ahead and trigger a NuGet restore so that we don't have to deal with any of those pieces as well. So this allows me to very simply write some C-sharp code without having to have all the cruft of a VS project, without having to necessarily manage a whole bunch of complex things. I can just take advantage of the .NET platform. So this code right here, if you guys, you know, want to know what it's doing. It's essentially going to look for this name parameter on the query string that comes in. And if I doesn't see the name parameter, it's going to go ahead and just prompt me to go ahead and give it the um, name. And if I do pass the name parameter, it's going to go ahead and respond to me, hello, with the name. So let's go ahead and do that. This URL here is already set up for me to be able to respond to, so I don't need to set up like another, I don't need to set up the actual endpoint that responds to this. It automatically has an endpoint provision for it whenever I go ahead and create an HTTP-based um, function. So I go ahead and hit this endpoint. And you can see here, um, we've got this message here saying, uh, please pass a name on the query string or on the request body. So let's go ahead and do this. So go ahead and just slap world on there because I'm not original. And there we go, we get hello world coming in there. And you can see that it's doing the XML uh, serialization. This is because the default content type that Chrome requests is actually application XML, not application JSON, as some people might expect. And we honor the default content type that the browser sends us. And so since we're not sending it anything, it's sending us back XML. But if you use IE, which I probably should have done for this demo, it sends us back JSON, because IE somehow defaults to JSON for some reason. Um, so very simply, I now have an endpoint that I can kind of write an API to respond to here. So if I wanted to go ahead and you know, build a, a very simple API endpoint that was talking to you know, SQL or storage, and I just needed that single endpoint. I don't want to deploy a whole API application. I need this one endpoint to extend my API. Functions are a great choice for that because there's not a lot of management. There's not a lot of development that I have to do. It's just kind of get to the point, focus on the business logic I need to implement, and don't worry about the rest of the stack that normally comes along with hosting a web application. Going further than that, it's useful for more than just doing HTTP. We also have the ability to kind of do timed events. You know, timed events are really useful when you need to, for instance, run a process once a day, like cleaning up a database or running some kind of custom uh, bit of logic that you need to do once a day to call out to something, clean something up, delete your blobs, you know, anything that you really have there. And so here I have a demo that I've already kind of got somewhat provisioned. Um, this thing's running every 10 seconds, and it's essentially all it's doing is I'm now outputting two queue items. Um, which are saying hello world and second world, right? And every single 10 seconds, I'm going ahead and dropping those two queue items out there. The way that I set up those queue items was I went ahead and went to my integrate tab and I set my output. This output here you can see is outputting uh, to a parameter called output that's passed along. And I have this queue name, which I've just called demo queue random number. And I've set up my storage account here that it's actually talking to here. I didn't have to go and manage connection strings. I was, I'm actually able to go ahead and just select things via the UX here. So I don't actually have to go and manage those connection strings anymore. I just say which one I want to talk to and we manage the, that actual connection for you. So from there, what's happening is those things are being dropped in and then I have my uh, queue trigger, which I developed in a very similar way. But in this case, instead of it reacting on a timer, it's now reacting on this queue. So now it's going to be listening on this queue and you can see that it's set up with the exact same thing. I've got demo queue 55 here and it's going to go ahead and my parameter name is going to be my queue item. So you can see that my queue item is coming across right here, and then about every 10 seconds we should see messages coming across. So if you go ahead and look inside of here, I'm going ahead and getting this thing run, and it's just going to go ahead and log out what my queue item is whenever it does that. So very, very simple way to be able to actually listen on a queue in that way. I don't need to worry about having to deploy a full application. I can do this with my language of choice. For instance, one of the samples that I have, if we had a lot of time to go ahead and, and get into things, is I actually have, um, this uh, file trigger that I wrote here in batch, which I'm sure that all of you guys kind of think, well, you know, batch is really great, but as soon as I'm going to go into the cloud, I wonder if I could use a more, uh, you know, a, a better language. But batch is actually really useful if you have an existing, like, executable that you've kind of run, like, a Windows service for every couple of, you know, you know, you're running that once a day on your local machine. You can take that same executable, 
you know, upload it to your function application and then just have the batch file call out to it via a timer trigger to go and trigger that thing. Or in this case, what I'm doing here is you can see here that I'm actually, um, the scenario that I had for this uh, demo is if I upload files to my Dropbox, I actually go ahead and append our MIT license header to each of those files that I have in my Dropbox that's a JS or a CS file. So that way I don't have to actually remember to add all those headers myself, it's just done automatically for me. And you can see that this thing in this case is actually listening on Dropbox. So we've set up a connection to Dropbox here, and we also have the ability to kind of set up uh, connections to, uh, what is it? Blob, Box, Dropbox, and OneDrive and OneDrive for Business. So I can actually go ahead and listen and also send files off to these various endpoints in, you know, abstracting it away. So the cool thing about this is if I go ahead and swap out this uh, function that I have triggering based off of Dropbox files coming in, I can swap that out to Google Drive or Blob or anything else, and there's zero code changes because we've abstracted away this notion of a file into just the code. So we're, we're being passed along a file, and I don't need to know where it came from. I can just work on that file, and if I want to locally develop with Dropbox, because it's easier to be able to work with than blo uh, Blob Storage, and then later swap that out to Blob Storage for production, I can do that. It's light and flexible enough to kind of do that, and it helps abstract away the underlying concepts you're working with. So I can work with just streams or pocos or strings or whatever I want to go ahead and work with there. I don't need to worry about how that content's actually getting to me. The runtime manages that. Cool, so that's just kind of simple hello world scenarios there with functions. I've got a um, kind of larger end-to-end -end sample that I want to get through, and I've got about 15 minutes left before Dan's going to kick me off the stage, so I'm just going to go ahead and kind of move right along. So getting to the actual kind of meat of, you know, what we want to talk about here is actually kind of in talking about integration patterns with app service. So we've got this large toolbox. How do I use all those tools, right? That, that initial page that I showed you there with all the different Azure services on there, you know, it's great that we have a bunch of services, but how can you use them? Um, and specifically in mind, I hope to answer the questions of the things within that green box, how can we use those to solve the scenarios that we're all here at this conference to talk about? So I've just chosen three kind of generic patterns to talk through, and I've got a sample which kind of goes ahead and exercises these notions. But I want to, you know, there's, there's kind of three patterns I see as we're trying to integrate systems. I have this notion of I want to kind of take a set of things and union them, union them together, right? I've got a set of APIs sitting across a bunch of various systems, and I need them to kind of look and act and behave in a consistent way. You know, one might be working in XML, one, one might be working in JSON, and I need these things to be consistent, and I don't want to necessarily have to change the way that they work to make them consistent. I just want to kind of shove them together and make them behave that way. In that same sense, you know, that's what transform is also good for. So I can take a set of data and I can transform it into another set of data, which is then more understandable by some further system down the line. And then to that same point, that system down the line, that's a flow, right? You know, one event, a happens, I need event B to happen subsequently and have that data flow along that process end to end. So these are just kind of three generic patterns that we can then use to assemble a variety of different applications once we kind of abstract these patterns, so these, these various applications that we build into these patterns. So with that in mind, I've got this example invoice processing. Here I want to have a unified API, so regardless of what's happening underneath the covers, I need it to kind of look consistent at the top level, right? So I want to be able to go ahead and do a get invoices and a post an invoice. And regardless of what platform that's running on underneath the covers, I want it to look consistent and behave consistently. Beyond that, I want to be able to upload an invoice, um, you know, as a file contents. So I need to be able to grab the raw file. In this case, I have a, uh, a lovely file type that I invented just to make it very, you know, a custom file type, I, I call it uh, YAML bars. It's a combination of YAML and handlebars. If any of you guys have ever used either of those things, I just combined the two of them for this sample, so that way we can have something which, clearly no one's gonna go build a YAML bars connector, so I'm gonna have to go write a custom connector to go parse this file content. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing in, in, in my demo here. And I need to be able to store the record, and then I have this other API which is just going to fetch the list of invoices, invoices that I have, and I want those to you know, kind of shore, uh, sh share a storage endpoint there. So let's think about how we can do this. So this first one that we have here is we have this kind of union pattern, right? We need to join these various things together. And these things might be running on various services. I might have already had that upload um, invoice API set up, and then someone asked me, hey, do I really have to go and 
actually read out this database every time that I want to go and see my invoices? Can't you just give me the list of invoices via the same API? And I'm like, okay, I can go ahead and add the API later. So maybe they're running on two different systems. So in that case, that's what API management is designed to do. You know, I've got a set of various things that are floating around out there and I needed to kind of bring them together, wrangle them together, and make them look consistent for my consumers. The next pattern that we have is kind of transform. And there's lots of different ways of doing this. There's a lot of out-of-the-box connectors for doing transformations that you should take advantage of because you shouldn't have to write custom, thing, custom code if you don't want to. Um, but for the event that you've invented a crazy format like YAML bars, you can go ahead and write a function which goes ahead and does that parsing for you so you don't have to manage it. In my case, for the YAML bars format, I actually combine just two NuGet packages, one that will go ahead and transform handlebars and one that will transform YAML. And I just kind of call one after the other in my code, and that makes it nice and simple for me. And so four things that makes that's easier to drop down to code for. Let's say that you already have a legacy parser for that file content that you're using in your existing systems. Just, you can take that same process there and move that into a function and have that kind of work for you. In that same vein, if I didn't want to use a function, if I wanted to use something which is, you, we may be considered more robust for application development, though I don't see why you wouldn't want to use a function. Functions are great. Um, you could actually use like an API app for doing that. So I could go ahead and just do what I would normally do inside of an API application for doing that processing as well. And then the other pattern that we have there is then flow. And for anything that I need to be doing with kind of flowing data through things, Logic Caps is kind of the obvious choice there. And taking advantage in combination with flow, uh, with, uh, in combination with Logic Caps connectors, you know, I don't want to have to write a custom API endpoint for talking to table storage or talking to, to SQL. I don't want to have to write a, um, a connector for going ahead and grabbing files in and out of Dropbox or sending messages to various endpoints. Just take advantage of the stuff that's already been done for you. I, I think that point was hammered into y yesterday, but that's the power of having all these kind of out of the box connectors is that, you know, the demo that I'm about to show you guys today, I built in like two hours. It's, you know, it's a fairly, it's a fairly rich demo, but because Logic Apps just builds all that stuff for me and because functions are so easy to use and API management does that abstraction for me, this is a fairly simple demo to set up even though it's doing something pretty cool. And having to write that code myself would have taken me two days and it would have been buggy. <laughs> now I don't have those bugs. Um, so you notice that we still have this blank circle here. The interesting thing here is that this isn't really necessarily an integration scenario, but I need to be thinking about how can I implement that API and that decision is impactful for me because I'm now kind of having to you know, really answer for the decisions I made in the past by using API management. So what's the right kind of way of exposing that API? I mean, it depends on the history of what this API was doing. If I had implemented that get invoice list API first before I did the logic app one, and I've got that API running on prem already and I don't want to touch that code, I don't want to lift and shift it, I can just go ahead and use VPN or Express Route to go ahead and connect to on prem. Or let's say that I had a vendor implement it in a different cloud system, like I'm no, I'm no longer using Azure, I'm using something else. I can go ahead and connect to other clouds using the same kind of you know, notion of having a VNet that's shared across things. And then beyond that, let's say that this is new code, right? And I wanna go ahead and implement this and I don't wanna have to go and do something on-prem because we should be trying to move to the cloud. I go ahead and use an API app if this is gonna be a set of rich you know, APIs that I'm gonna have there and I wanna use my traditional way of developing applications, I can go ahead and just deploy a web API up as an, uh, as an API app. But let's say this is just a single API and you just need to go ahead and just for this one scenario expose this get invoices thing and I don't wanna have to go ahead and deploy a full web API and manage that in source control. Well, you, can still, you should still manage it in source control but I don't wanna necessarily have to do the full build process and all those things that come along with it. I could then use functions which are much more lightweight. I can still do continuous integration with functions. I can still do all my normal processes, but it's a lot easier and more lightweight to develop. And I can work with the various input and output bindings to help reduce the amount of code that I have to use to actually go and fetch that data for my API endpoint. So in my case, I chose functions because it's dealer's choice and I'm just slinging functions everywhere that I can. So that's the reason I went with that. So in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and just show quickly the pieces of this demo that I have. And then looking at my time, I've got about five minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to show the demo in five minutes and also do my wrap up. So, so what I've done here is the first step of course was to go ahead and kind of create my API management. The first thing that I did uh, because I was trying to be responsible was go ahead and set up my API the way that I wanted my API to work. And so in this case I have my post and my post accepts some data about my invoice. And I should say here that my 
sample diagram actually says upload file and it processes a file, but like I said, I forgot my charger here last night, so I was working on a different machine that I hadn't had the slide deck on, and this is why you should work off of specs, because I slightly implemented this differently from what my PowerPoint demo looks like, and so my PM would be complaining at me that I'd misimplemented <laughs> the, uh, the, the application. But in this case, I'm doing something very similar. In this case, I'm uploading uh, JSON, and then I'm taking that JSON and I'm filing that into my YAML bars uh, template that I've already got set up on the server, and I'll show you guys that. And then um, in this case, I have git invoices. And then so in this case, git invoices is just a simple git. There's no parameters that are passed in there. I just want to fetch all the invoices I ever had. Not a good API, but like I said, built this very quickly. I can set up like time boundaries and things like that that I could then kind of restrict which invoices I wanted to get. But this is just kind of simple. Um, and I don't really know why it's asking me to sign in now, but. Um, cool, so now I've got my API management stuff set up. Let's think about how I implemented that. So if we go ahead and jump back into API management and go to the publisher uh, portal, if we go look at these APIs, invoice, Cool, so you can see I've got my post and I've got my git. If I go to my post invoice here, you can see that I've actually got this set up and this is actually gonna point to workflows, GUID, some random stuff. This is the strain that I got from Logic Apps. You'd never wanna show this to an actual customer, right? Because that's you know, a, a big puddle of mud. You wouldn't actually want to show that as a part of an actual REST API. But that's what API management's for, and it's still really simple to actually talk to that Logic App in that case. I didn't have to go and provision a web API endpoint for that Logic App, it's done for me. Um, you know, but the consequence of that is I got this kind of lack of control over what that API looks like. So with API management, I can then kind of put that back into the pattern that I want to. So if, let's go ahead and just jump out to Postman I have. Postman, you can see here that in this case, I've got both versions of this. I've got that regular endpoint, and I wanna go ahead and just push this thing here and just kind of prove to you guys that this stuff is real. If I run this now, this is the thing which does the, the Git um, invoice. You can see here that I have these folks, these ones in here. Once I run those other two commands, I should see two more records in here. They're just using the date and for these two samples. So I'll go ahead and run this one, which is going to talk directly to the Logic App. And I've got this one here, which is then going to talk to API management, which then redirects, you know, kind of does a pass through end to the Logic App. So these both ran, both got 202 accepted. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit this, and you can see that we already have our new um, records in here. You know, 5, 12, 2016, 1, and 5, 12, 2016, 2. Um, and if we go ahead and then jump over to what I, we did with the logic app, this is what the actual logic that we implemented was. So in this case, I have my when HTTP request is received manual trigger. I've got process invoice function. In this case, I wrote a function which does that processing of the data that comes in and it outputs basically a YAML body. I then go ahead and I wanted to store this in Dropbox in this case because that's what my you know, simple demo wanted to use. Let's say that I've got business users that are using Dropbox for managing these invoices. I can go ahead and just kind of drop them there where they're used to getting them. In this case, I go ahead and just slap the file content as the body of my function in that case. So I just kind of take everything that my function returned and slap that into a file and I'm naming that file GUID.txt. And then from there, I'm going ahead and also posting it to the Slack channel. Let's say that my sales folks are actually using Slack to help communicate. And so in this case, I'm going ahead and also sending a message out to my Slack channel saying, hey, by the way, a new invoice has arrived, so make sure that you go ahead and process that. And then I'm also going ahead and doing this um, webhook here where I'm then sending this data back out to table storage, you know, kind of munged a bit inside of this other function that I use. So I kind of used these few steps here, each one quite simple to do and just kind of flow data uh, through here, and it's quite reliable. So if I jump back out, we should be able to see, if I jump back out to Slack, you gotta love their like friendly messages that they have. If I jump out to my bot channel, you can see here that I've got two new invoices. And the, uh, the other things that you see here are the other demo that I kind of skipped because I was kind of running short on time, is I've got every single tweet about Azure Functions running through Logic Apps, being sent through a function which I'm doing sentiment analysis on, and then I'm posting that out to the same Slack channel. So you can see here that I can then look at the sentiment score of all the various tweets that are coming around functions, and I can kind of eyeball which ones 
are positive and which ones are less positive. They're all positive, it's just some are more positive. Um, so that's, that, and then that's really it. I mean, if we wanted to, you know, I don't want to go ahead and abuse Dan's time. I'm now over my time limit here, but I can also go ahead and show the function, and the function's just that simple C-sharp code. There's no real complexities there, but it all ties together very nicely. I'm not having to go ahead and do anything which seems odd or weird. Nothing took me too long to actually do. It just kind of works out of the box. Get started, go ahead and go to functions at azure.com and try out functions. It's very, very simple to kind of provision your first function app and get started. If you haven't used App Service yet, you should. Go ahead and go to tryappservice.azure.com, and with Try App Service, you can actually use that without even having an Azure account, if for some reason you don't have one. So that one's a really nice way of just trying out the service. Um, and then contact me uh, you know, for any questions that you have around functions or App Service, uh, anything that you saw me present on here today, if you want my demo, I, I'll send you my demo code too. Um, just send me an email. And then I'm also accessible at Crandy Codes, and I also watch the at Azure Functions handle if you'd rather use that one. Uh, so, we don't have any, really any time for questions. Maybe if Dan wants to walk up here, I can answer questions as he's getting set up. Um, but beyond that, you know, thank you everyone for your time.